So far, we have just been talking about the characteristics of single atoms and ions. But in this lecture, we're going to move towards talking about actual molecules and bonding, which is very exciting. The objectives are ionic bonds, covalent bonds, properties of ionic bonds, properties of covalent bonds, and we're going to introduce you to Lewis symbols and the octet rule. So the definition of a chemical bond is that it's simply an arrangement of nuclei and electrons such that the bonded atoms result in a lower energy than for the separate atoms. Another way of thinking about this is that the bonding occurs because you're going to a lower potential energy. And there's a couple different types of bonding, ionic bonding and covalent bonding. In ionic bonding, you have an electrostatic interaction. So you have an interaction between a cation and an anion that pack together to form this ionic solid. These cations and anions typically, typically form through the transfer of an electron. In covalent bonding, you have orbital overlap to create a covalent bond where you're sharing electrons. So we've talked about how orbitals are really just wave functions, and we can determine the probability of the electrons by squaring the wave function. So if these orbitals can overlap in a constructive manner so that we have constructive interference, then we can create a covalent bond where now we have more probability of electron density between the two atoms than we would otherwise. There's a few properties of ionic compounds. The first is that ionic compounds tend to be hard, rigid, and brittle. Also, ionic compounds do not conduct electricity in the solid state. But if they are dissolved or melted, then the ions are free to move and they can carry a current. And this you can measure with a conductivity probe. I also wanted to briefly mention periodic trends of lattice energy. So lattice energy is the energy required to separate one mole of an ionic solid into gaseous ions. So lattice energy is the measure of the strength of the ionic bond. And it's based, we can determine the lattice energy for an ionic, bo an ionic bond using Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law just measures the force between two charges, and that's all an ionic bond is, as it's just the force between a cation and an anion. Lattice energy is directly proportional to the electrostatic energy. So it's the charge of the cation times the charge of the anion divided by the radius of the cation plus the radius of the anion. If we have a higher charge for our cation and anion, that will increase the lattice energy. And the smaller the radius for our cation and anion, that will increase the lattice energy. So as lattice energy increases, the melting point increases. So we can make predictions of melting points based on size and charge. So all of these ions are just have a charge of plus one or minus one, but you can see that for our smaller ions, lithium and fluoride, we have a much larger lattice energy than if we form rubidium iodide because they're larger, so they have a bigger distance between the two of them, which decreases the electrostatic interaction or energy and decreases the lattice energy. For covalent bonding, we can predict whether a bond will form based on how energetically favorable it is to form this bond. And we can think about this by looking at a potential energy graph. So what this, this fig is a figure from your OpenStax textbook, and this is for H, the hydrogen-hydrogen bond in, in H2 gas. And it shows that when these atoms are really, really far apart, they have this energy that we're going to call zero. And the closer, they start, as they start to approach one another, become much more stable. They have this big drop in potential energy. But then if you push them too close again, they'll start increasing in potential energy. So the potential energy for a covalent bond is made up of three parts. Nuclear-nuclear repulsion, electron-nuclear attraction, and electron-electron repulsion. When these atoms start to approach one another, they will decrease in potential energy because of this electron-nuclear attraction. But if you push them too close together, then they'll have some pretty large repulsive forces due to the nuclear-nuclear repulsion and the electron-electron repulsion. But bonding in a covalent bond is not a perfect share of electrons. For two atoms that have the same electronegativity or the same ability to pull negative charge, then the sharing of electrons between these two atoms will be equivalent. If we have one atom that's more electronegative, such as hydrogen and fluorine, we'll have unequal sharing. This is what we call a polar bond.
Same thing with hydrochloric acid. Chlorine is much more like electronegative than hydrogen, a lot because it has this high effective nuclear charge. It really wants to go to that noble gas configuration, so it, it's very favorable for the chlorine to bear this negative charge. So this is a polar bond. Electronegativity increases as you go across the periodic table and decreases as you go down. And these are the Pauling electronegativity scales. The Pauling electronegativity scale in, factors in both electron affinity and ionization energy. And you can see that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Oxygen, sulfur, and chlorine are also very electronegative. So if there's zero difference in electronegativity between atoms, then we say that this is a purely covalent bond. If there is a intermediate difference between electronegativity, then we say this is a polar covalent bond. So we say it's covalent bond if the electronegativity difference is less than 0.4. It's a polar covalent bond if it's between 0.4 and 1.8. And it's an ionic bond if there's a very large electronegativity difference. So if you have a bond between sodium and chloride, you can see that 3.0 minus 0.9 is a difference of 2.1. So sodium chloride is going to be an ionic bond rather than a covalent bond.